So I'm Bill Dolly, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're here in, Linda and I are here in Tucson um, and want to acknowledge that Tucson is the traditional lands of the autumn and wherever you are tonight, let's all take a moment to contemplate and acknowledge our debt to the indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands we're on this evening. I also want to thank the Smith family. Um, it, their support makes this uh, cafe series possible. We're, this is our fifth out of eight uh, of the cafes for this year. So we're in the second half tonight. Um, so thank you, Jean, Eldon, and Jay for your important support. And <clears throat> tonight's speaker, uh, Caitlin Bishop, She's an assistant professor at the University of uh, Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Her doctorate uh, earned in 2019 from University of California, Los Angeles. And she describes herself as an anthropological archeologist. I was looking through her bio today and noticed that she seems to be also firmly committed to preservation archeology. span She notes, in addition to conducting field work, I'm dedicated to working extensively with museum collections, arch archival documents, and legacy data, the good stuff of uh, preservation archeology. span So tonight she'll be sharing with us the importance of birds in Chaco Canyon. And we'll turn it over to Caitlin. Caitlin. Wonderful, let me share my screen. Okay, thank you so much, Bill, for that introduction. Uh, and to Linda, Bill and Linda for having me here tonight. I'm really excited and grateful for the opportunity to be involved in this wonderful series of Archaeology Cafe on birds. Uh, I've been preceded by some excellent speakers this season and I will be followed by several more now that we're kicking, kicking off, excuse me, the, the second half of the series. So tonight I'm gonna to be talking to you about birds in Chaco Canyon and how those birds were valued in the past. And I do wanna remind people that uh, if you would like to, if my face is blocking your screen, you can either move my face around or uh, I believe you can minimize my face as well. Okay, so I know that many of you listening tonight already know a lot about Chaco Canyon, probably many of you do. Uh, An Archaeology Southwest Cafe series has actually hosted many talks on Chaco in the past. So while Chaco probably needs very little introduction for some of you, I nonetheless feel obliged to give you sort of a, a brief necessary background, just in case anyone needs a refresher or there are Chaco novices listening in. So the canyon itself is, of course, located in the San Juan Basin in the northwestern corner of New Mexico. I've marked it on the map with a red star. And that broader swath of red is just the broader ancestral Pueblo region uh, within which Chaco is located. Occupation of the canyon really began as early as 3,000 years ago in the Basket Maker II period. But of course, uh, most people who reference Chaco Canyon are speaking primarily about the time in which the canyon was most densely occupied. Uh, and that is the end of the Pueblo I and throughout the Pueblo II periods. And that is the time period that I'm speaking about today. So from the early, uh, early 9th century to the mid 12th century, Chaco was the center of a large regional network that really spread out over the Northern Southwest. And there are several pretty remarkable traits that characterize this period of occupation of the canyon, uh, which is sometimes referred to as its fluorescence or the Chaco fluorescence. So first, within just uh, an 11 kilometer stretch of the canyon, there are 13 great houses that were built. These are monumentally constructed, multi-storied masonry pueblos uh, extending from the easternmost Wajiji to the westernmost Penasco Blanco that you can see on the map here. Most of those were built on the canyon bottom. Some of them were uh, elevated on the surrounding mesas. And then an even tighter cluster uh, was concentrated in what is referred to as downtown Chaco. And if you've ever visited Chaco Canyon, these are the sites that you can visit on the Loop Road. 
Uh, in addition to those 13 great houses, approximately 200 known small house sites were also built in and around the canyon. Small house sites being, of course, smaller than great houses. It's right there in the name. Uh, and typically only one story as opposed to multiple stories. The most famous of those small house sites are, are what are known as the BC sites that are also located in downtown Chaco uh, in close proximity to uh, Casa Rinconada, the very famous isolated Great Kiva. Um, architecture aside, Chaco is also famous for the variety of non-local goods that were imported into the canyon from places like California, Mexico, and other parts of the Southwest. Uh, as well as its central location in a massive network of outlier communities uh, whose architectural styles mimicked or mirrored or adapted uh, those of sites within the canyon, really demonstrating the extent of the cultural network. And then lastly, um, an extensive road network across the greater Chaco landscape made connections between the canyon, outlier communities, uh, geographical features, shrines, and other parts of the landscape. Despite all that has been written about Chaco and its long history of excavation, Chaco sort of continues to suffer from somewhat of an identity crisis. Uh, there are debates about the nature of occupation in the canyon, as well as how the Chaco system was structured. There have been many models that have been proposed for exactly what Chaco Canyon was to itself and to the rest of the San Juan Basin. Uh, but regardless of, of disagreements between different scholars about what Chaco Canyon actually was, central to most of those models uh, that have been proposed is the idea that Chaco played a ceremonial role within its network and that ritual was really important in the canyon. Scholars also debate the size of the local population of people living within the great houses and small house sites in Chaco and how many people the canyon could have supported. Scholars continue to look for evidence of whether the primary axis of social organization in the canyon was akin to clan dominant organization or moiety dominant organization or some measure of each drawing on uh, predominantly models from the ethnographic record from modern Pueblos. And although many people now accept that some level of social inequality distinguished either certain individuals from one another or certain families or certain social groups within Chaco Canyon, we're still drawing together lines of evidence to interpret the basis of that inequality. Um, it is not my intent uh, to weigh in on most of these debates tonight with, that, uh, with the exception of the last one, uh, which I will be speaking about. So many studies of Chaco today focus actually, uh, as Bill mentioned, um, in terms of my own research, they focus on existing collections as well as the detailed reconstruction of context by using early excavation records from the canyon. And it's those materially focused studies that are really well suited to address the nature and foundation of social inequality in Chaco Canyon. And there's a whole host of really great scholars uh, that are currently doing collections-based research on material from Chaco Canyon or who have recently done so. And then birds in particular, as a potentially very valuable ceremonial resource, they are just one lens through which we can address social inequality in Chaco Canyon. And I will be doing so this evening. Chaco has had a very long history of excavation on and off spanning almost the last 130 years. The earliest formal excavations began in the late 1800s and continued again in the 1920s, focused on the great house uh, of Pueblo Benito, the most famous. Those excavations were followed uh, by excavations conducted by the University of New Mexico, which uncovered part of another great house, Chetro Kettle, but also focused heavily on uh, the many small house sites that had not received a lot of attention before that time. Then in the 1970s, the National Park Service initiated the Chaco Project, which conducted a, a complete survey of park lands. They documented nearly 1,800 sites and tested and excavated uh, about 70 of those, including a part of um, another great house, Pueblo Alto. More recently, the Chaco Stratigraphy Pod Project, led by Patty Crown and Chip Wills at UNM, focused on the re-excavation of certain contexts in, uh, in order to clarify stratigraphy. Now, because of this long history of excavation in the canyon, uh, projects that have been sponsored by many different institutions, that means that the artifacts and the archival records from those projects are really spread across the country. Uh, and that sometimes makes synthetic research on any given type of material or artifact 
uh, quite challenging for Chaco. But those collections, when we can synthesize them and can work with them, they are massive and they have uh, really great potential for expanding our interpretations of Chaco Canyon. My goal for the research I'm discussing this evening was to analyze all of the bird bone that had ever been excavated from Chaco in order to produce a, a complete synthetic data set of all avifaunal remains or bird bone from Chaco. And I did that with several questions uh, that I was hoping to address. So using that synthetic data set that I constructed from my analysis of all bird bone, what could we discover about how birds were used and valued by people who lived in Chaco? Uh, so how can we really characterize the nature of the human bird relationship? And then from there, because birds can be a valuable ceremonial resource to people, both whole birds themselves and their feathers, as I'm gonna talk about, what does the use of birds reveal about ceremonial organization at a larger scale across different sites in Chaco Canyon? And then more specifically, what can bird use tell us about the nature and the foundation of social inequality? So to start this project, I had to uh, run around the country for a while, or I should say I got to run around the country for a while, spending time at each of the places that are listed here. I was hosted by exceptionally lovely people who really put up with my extended and repeated long-term presence at their institutions, uh, all of whom are acknowledged at the end of this presentation, but who really made this research possible. Uh, I worked with six different museums or institutions analyzing nearly 12,000 bone fragments that refit to just over 11,000 NISP, what we call number of identified specimens or NISP, uh, which is just a basic counting measure in zooarchaeology that reflects the number of bones. And my analysis of these uh, materials consisted of recording a total of 41 different variables for each bone or fragment of bone. And the analysis I conducted was visual and non-destructive. All right, on to the good stuff. So we can sort of meet the birds, so to speak. Uh, Chaco is very famous for its macaws and thick-billed parrots, especially its scarlet macaws. Uh, birds that you will actually hear more about in May from my wonderful colleagues, Chris Schwartz, Steve Plogg, and Pat Gilman. And we all know and love the macaws. And while I will talk about them a little bit today, I'm actually much more interested in talking about the other types of birds that people also valued in Chaco, in addition to the macaws. So a total of 42 different types of birds were captured or traded in or otherwise procured by the inhabitants of Chaco. Those include a variety of birds of prey. So eagles, hawks, raptors, or excuse me, falcons, owls, vultures, et cetera. Uh, our lovely more terrestrial birds, uh, turkey and quail, as well as several types of waterfowl, ducks and sandhill crane in particular. Uh, we also have our woodpeckers, our flicker, our doves and our pigeons, and then a variety of perching birds, uh, also colloquially referred to as songbirds, including species like American crow, already mentioned in the chat today, uh, black-billed magpie, pinion jay, uh, and the beautiful bluebird. And all of these birds, excepting the parrots, are local to the state of New Mexico today. They might not all have been available in Chaco Canyon proper because some uh, prefer slightly more wooded habitats, but you can ask me about that later if you like. Okay, so we can look uh, first at the proportionate contribution of each of these different types of birds in the avifaunal assemblage, in the collection of bird bone, as a proxy to sort of assess their relative importance to people in Chaco. And when we do that, when we look at uh, the proportionate contribution of these different types of birds, there are three types of bird that emerge as the most significant. These are our turkeys, our macaws and parrots, and our raptors lumped together. Turkey is by far the most abundantly represented bird, so their remains comprise nearly half of the entire assemblage. And turkeys are the only truly domesticated birds in the Southwest uh, at this time, and one of the only domesticated animals at all. Uh, we know based on multiple lines of evidence that people were probably raising domestic turkeys in Chaco Canyon, but what we don't know is if wild turkey was also brought into the canyon in addition to domestic turkey. So that's a project I would like to set some of my colleagues uh, that are listening in tonight on uh, in terms of figuring it out. Um, the next most abundantly represented birds are the macaws and parrots, uh, very famous. So these are so highly represented in terms of their numbers of bones. Um, 
simply because, as I'll talk about in a minute, many of them were initially deposited as complete or partially articulated skeletons. So many of them were buried in special contexts. So that means that the number of bones that are represented in our collection of bird bone, uh, they are overrepresented because they were complete uh, skeletons or partially complete skeletons. But then the uh, third most abundantly represented type of bird are the raptors. So your eagles, hawks, falcons, owls, and vultures. Uh, and then all other birds, perching birds, water birds, woodpeckers, doves, pigeons, even when those are lumped together, they make up just a minor part of the assemblage. So just about 1%. Of course, I should note, uh, being a responsible zooarchaeologist, I have to say, of course, that there is an inescapable taphonomic problem here with the smaller birds, which is to say that their remains are more susceptible to not surviving in the archaeological record. Uh, and they're also more likely to be missed in excavation, especially in cases where screens weren't being used, uh, which is true, unfortunately, of many uh, excavations in Chaco Canyon. So they could be underrepresented for that reason. Now, ethnographic accounts, uh, this is blank for a reason. I'll, I'll add bullet points in a second to sort of build the argument here. But our ethnographic accounts from the Southwest that were written in the 20th century, they talk a lot about how birds, especially their feathers, were important in ceremonies across many Pueblo communities. And we also know of bird burials found at archaeological sites throughout the Southwest. Consequently, uh, we often assume that the remains of birds at archaeological sites made it into the archaeological record as a result of ceremonial activities or ritual activities uh, or the acquisition of feathers to be used in the manufacture of certain types of ritual objects. However, birds can of course be eaten, uh, although there are very few mentions in ethnographic literature of the regular consumption of birds. But we can of course test for that using the avifaunal record for, from Chaco. So evidence of what we call heat treatment or burning is a possible indicator of consumption since bone had to come into contact with a heat source in the process of cooking or often does. But incidences of heat treatment are not at all common in the Chaco avifaunal assemblage where only two and a half percent of all bird bone appears to have come into contact with a heat source. Additionally, the act of butchering birds can leave evidence on bones in the form of things like cut marks. Uh, but those indications are also rare in the Chaco avifaunal assemblage with only 2.7% of all bones bearing evidence of butchery. And of that small number of bones that were heat treated, uh, I should note that nearly half of those come from Turkey. And there are several other uh, good indications that Turkey was at least sometimes consumed. So there are several sterna or breast bones that had long shallow scrape marks along their keels uh, that suggest the removal of breast meat. So just to give you a little bit of, of a, a frame of reference for these numbers. So uh, my colleague, Adam Watson, in his analysis of faunal remains from a uh, small house site BC 57 in Chaco Canyon, he found that 31% of all bighorn sheep bones uh, exhibited heat treatment and 28% exhibited indications of butchery, which makes our numbers for birds look quite small. So all of this is to say that there is uh, very limited evidence that people were, were routinely eating birds in Chaco uh, although turkey does appear to have been eaten on occasion. Another possible use of birds is for the manufacture of tools or other objects using their bones. And bird bone was occasionally used to make objects and tools in Chaco, both utilitarian objects and tools, uh, as well as those of ceremonial or ornamental value, including things uh, spanning those categories like awls, needles, beads, uh, and whistles and flutes. It does not, however, appear to be the case that this was a major reason for acquiring birds since worked specimens in any form, finished, unfinished, regardless, they comprise only 5% of the avifaunal assemblage. Uh, I think it is also worth noting that the forms of objects and tools that were made using bird bone, um, of all of those, tube beads uh, shown on the left, for example, uh, those account for more than half of all worked bird bone. So that seems to be the thing that was most commonly made out of bird bone. Okay, we've established so far that while birds may have been occasional contributions to the diet of people living in Chaco, especially sometimes turkey, uh, and while bird bone sometimes was sometimes used to manufacture objects, 
neither dietary concerns nor a sort of robust bone manufacturing industry really seem to have been the primary reason driving the acquisition of birds in Chaco Canyon, nor the primary reasons uh, that people valued birds. Instead, the most important involvement of birds in Chaco in life was ritual or ceremonial in nature. And speaking rather generally, birds can be involved in ceremonial life in a variety of direct and indirect ways. So whole live birds can be incorporated into ritual practice as participants, especially living participants, ultimately ending up uh, uh, in dedicatory deposits that are created where their skeletons or their, their whole bodies are placed. Um, articulated portions of birds like wings, legs, feet can be offered in dedicatory ways as well in place of complete birds. So standing in for the complete bird. Parts of birds, especially wings, can be used in ritual practice as parts of ceremonial attire or ritual paraphernalia, objects used in ritual. Uh, and those can also ultimately end up in special dedicatory deposits uh, when they're retired from ceremonial use. And we'll talk about one example this evening. And of course, uh, feathers can be used and today are used extensively uh, in making ceremonial clothing and objects that are involved in ritual, including things like prayer sticks, ceremonial staffs, uh, and garments. The ritual use of birds uh, really encompasses many types of activities, both ritual practices themselves, as well as activities related to the preparation of ritual and the, the objects that are used in ritual. Uh, and once they are finally, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, and then they're uh, ultimately deposited in the archaeological record. Um, so we can see sort of all of these things in various ways. Not all of them are equally visible, right? So uh, we'll talk about bird burials tonight as well, which are highly visible. But some of these other uses that are related to ritual are a little bit more challenging to see. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can engage in a, a very detailed contextual analysis of the places uh, and the ways that bird remains were eventually discarded. And that can give us insight into the nature of ritual practice and the organization of ceremonial life in Chaco Canyon. So one of the most visible ways that birds were involved in ritual in Chaco is in acts of dedication or offering of either complete birds or articulated parts of birds like wings and legs. So these ritual practices that created these intentional dedicatory deposits uh, that likely were created to mark certain special occasions. And there are several different types of animals that received formal burial in Chaco Canyon in general, including things like dog, wolf, bobcat, even pronghorn antelope. But birds were overwhelmingly the most common choice for the ritual deposition of animals. There are far more bird burials than there are burials of any other kind of animal in Chaco Canyon. So for example, uh, birds, um, complete birds or articulated parts of birds were left on floors as rooms and structures were ritually closed or decommissioned. Birds were buried beneath floors as spaces were constructed. And then their parts were sometimes, so wings and legs, were sometimes placed in large quantities in unique contexts. And I'll give you, I'll, again, I'll give you an example of that this evening. There are a total of 84 of these cases uh, in Chaco Canyon of either complete or partial bird burials. And we find them at both great houses and small houses. But as we'll see, uh, those sorts of behaviors involving the burial of birds at these different sites actually looks different uh, at great houses versus small houses. Um, and I won't cover the bird burials in, in great detail here for a variety of reasons, but I will give you uh, just one um, uh, example that maybe some of you have already heard of or read about from the Great House of Pueblo Benito. So there are multiple bird burials within Pueblo Benito, either complete or partial birds. But in one particular room, room 38, there are two scarlet macaws that had each been buried in their own subfloor pit. So a little pit was dug into the floor. Each was lined with adobe and the macaws, one macaw was placed in each and then those pits were sealed to sort of conceal their location. Uh, as you can see on the map, um, Oh no, I didn't put it, sorry. But there are multiple rooms within uh, Pueblo Benito, especially in this highlighted red arc here uh, that is the first constructed part of Pueblo Benito. There's multiple rooms there that have macaw burials. Uh, but what makes room 38 sort of unique is that this room uh, has also been interpreted as an aviary that was used to house live macaws. Uh, and the reason we, we make that interpretation is that there is a really thick layer of bird droppings that was found on the floor of room 38, so 10 inches thick. Uh, and then 
uh, embedded in that layer are the skeletons of 12 additional macaws. So in this space, two scarlet macaws were buried in these subfloor pits, and then it looks like the room was used to house additional macaws. There is another special context that I wanna talk about as well that tells us quite a bit about how birds were valued in Chaco in the past. And this is really thanks to the work of the Chaco Project and especially people like Nancy Akins and Steve Emsley. Uh, and thanks to this work, we know about a feature that the Chaco Project called the Bird Pit at the Great House of Pueblo Alto, which is sitting just on top of the mesa here. You can kind of make it out uh, in this blue circle, the walls of Pueblo Alto rising into the sky. And then you can see multiple other sites within this photo as well. Benito, uh, that isolated great Kiva Casa Rinconada and small house BC 59. So the bird pit, so sometime near the founding of Pueblo Alto in the early 10 hundreds, this pit was dug into the Northeast corner of the central plaza of the great house. And then soon after it was created, it appears to have been relatively quickly filled with the legs and wings of many different kinds of raptors, including golden eagles, four different species of hawk, as well as a handful of parts from raven and bluebird. And the analysis of the contents of this pit, at least of the bird bone in this pit, shows us that 40 wings and 16 legs uh, were placed in this pit from at least 25 separate birds. And based on the timing and the contents of this pit, this pit may have served as a foundational deposit that was meant to mark the construction of the Great House of Pueblo Alto. Okay, so uh, we know complete birds were given formal burial, likely in the process of dedicating or closing certain spaces. And we know that the wings and the legs of birds, especially raptors, uh, were likely ceremonial objects or were also given formal burial. And then when we zoom out beyond these individual cases and special contexts, what can we learn about how these interactions with birds were different between great houses and small houses and how was ceremony uh, more broadly organized at the level of the overall canyon? So regarding the distinction between uh, great houses and small houses, differences in function for these different types of sites have been proposed uh, with great houses interpreted as more formal, wealthier or elite places. Uh, as well as the locations of these larger scale events that might have occurred there. And then small houses have been interpreted uh, as more domestic, smaller scale structures. And the involvement of birds in general in ritual practice is really a canyon wide phenomenon. We see bird burials across the canyon at multiple different sites, but based on the analysis of those burials across different sites, there do appear to be differences in how that ritual was carried out between great houses and small houses. So the ritual deposition of birds at great houses and small houses looks to be different in two very fundamental ways, in the types of birds that were involved and in the spaces in which those birds were placed. So I'll walk you through it. So at small house sites, ritual activity involving the burial of birds uh, most often took place in kivas or pit houses, while at great houses, they took place more often in these interior rectangular rooms. And at small house sites, both kivas and pit houses uh, likely served a more communal or domestic or sort of small scale ceremonial purpose, sort of a multifunction space. But rectangular rooms at great houses are markedly more private. They have restricted access points. Uh, many of the rectangular rooms at great houses that contain bird burials are really set far back off of the plaza. So they're challenging to access in these interior spaces. And so those rooms likely didn't serve the same sort of communal functions that kivas at small house sites did. And in many cases, those rectangular rooms couldn't have accommodated the same number of people. So the ritual deposition of birds uh, at great houses in particular might have been intentionally confined to these more private spaces in order to limit who could witness those occurrences. And then another fundamental difference between bird burials at great and small houses uh, is in the types of birds that the occupants of these sites involved in ritual. So in general, great house bird burials more frequently and in some cases exclusively involve taxa that were either exotic, like the macaws, or local taxa that are otherwise kind of challenging to procure, uh, like eagles and raptors. Uh, and then the taxa are the species that inhabitants of small house sites appear 
um, to have been using are quite different. So we have uh, turkeys involved very commonly at small house ritual, and we also see the appearance of hawks in bird barrels at small houses as well. Turkeys, of course, appear in both great house and small house bird burials uh, quite commonly. Uh, but it really looks like some of the species that uh, the occupants of great houses were involving in bird burials are types of birds to which the occupants of small houses might not have had regular or any access to. Uh, so this, these two things combined, the types of birds and the types of spaces, suggest that great and small house ritual involving birds uh, was uh, potentially quite different uh, from those uh, within those different types of structures, and that great house in general was more restricted, more esoteric uh, than the ritual that was taking place at small houses, which was less restricted and involved these easier to acquire birds that would have been more locally available on the landscape. Now that pattern of restricted distribution is not just reflected in bird burials, it's also reflected in the entire avifaunal assemblage. So when we look at all bird bone, not just that from burials. So it looks like macaws and eagles appear to have been disproportionately used by the occupants of great houses. Uh, the same is true to a slightly lesser degree um, of the smaller raptors, so the hawks and the falcons. And then on the other hand, the types of birds whose remains are more heavily concentrated at small houses are the locally available birds, like our quail, like our raven, that would have been uh, more easily acquired within or near to the canyon. Now macaws, as exotic birds, it may have been the case that only the inhabitants or the leaders of great houses had the resources or the connections to procure macaws uh, from breeders outside of the canyon. And then eagles, even though they are a locally available bird, they would not have been uh, highly abundant in the vicinity of the canyon, simply because eagles are highly solitary in nature, they have large territorial home ranges. And so those things combine to make sure that eagles typically have low population densities uh, within a given area, which is to say that they would have been uh, challenging to encounter frequently and to acquire frequently, and yet they are abundantly represented in the avifaunal assemblage. So that restricted use of macaws and eagles suggests that access to those birds as a valuable ceremonial resource was not equal across the canyon, and it might have been controlled uh, by ritual leaders or groups living at great houses. So what does this research add to our understanding of Chaco Canyon? First, we now, uh, where we didn't before, have an understanding of the reasons that birds were important to the people of Chaco. So the primary reason that they were acquired uh, and also of the birds that seem to have been most highly valued, our turkeys, our macaws, and our raptors, which really seem to have been the most important types of birds. Uh, and we can also see that it doesn't appear that either consumption of birds or uh, the use of their bones in manufacturing different types of objects were really primary factors that drove the acquisition of birds. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, second, it demonstrates that there were differences in the types of activities that took place at great houses and small houses, which suggests that those two types of sites did indeed serve different roles within the canyon community overall. So small house ritual involving birds was less restricted, less esoteric, involved these locally available and likely uh, more abundant taxa, while the ritual at uh, that was taking places at great houses was just the opposite of that. So it included or incorporated exotic or challenging to procure species uh, and carrying out those activities uh, in great houses that occurred in these spaces that were more challenging to access and might've had restricted audiences. And then third, uh, this work supports the conclusion that power and leadership in Chaco was based on ritual knowledge and differential access to ceremonial resources. Uh, and that birds were one of those resources, which shouldn't be too surprising given what we know uh, about how valuable they are uh, in the modern Pueblos today. And then lastly, it's not on the slide here, but I, I want to, and I'd like to draw attention to the fact that even though we understand turkeys to have been really abundant, and even though the macaws have this, this kind of allure for Chaco Canyon and other places in the Southwest, to me, it's the raptors, so primarily hawks and eagles in particular, uh, that really seem to have played a very important role in the human bird relationship in Chaco Canyon. And they, they seem to have had major ceremonial significance, uh, so much so that people likely went to these really great lengths to procure them uh, on a regular basis. Um, and I will stop there and thank you very much to all of these people on the slide and, and to Archaeology Southwest and the CAFE series for hosting me. Oh, thank you, Caitlin. Of course.
You know, I'm an old, old zooarchaeologist, so yeah. I always love birds and, <laughs> you know, and it's always fun. Yeah. So anyway, like I said, my technology is uh, a little weird here tonight, but I think we're going to be okay. We got some questions coming in and if you can bear with us for a while, let me ask some questions and, and um, see if we can, you know, answer a few questions here. Sure. So, um, one of the first questions we had was about the macaws and the parrots. Um, sure. Might they have been bred in the canyon? And I think you mm. suggested that they probably were brought in, but could you? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I hope that my colleagues in, in May will talk about it more too. But um, there's very limited evidence slash none evidence that they were bred in the canyon. So our current understanding is that they were actually bred outside of the canyon, but still somewhere in the Southwest slash the Mexican Northwest. So within the broad Southwest region, it looks like they're being bred somewhere. Um, so that is to say that it doesn't look like people are acquiring them directly from Southern or Central Mexico, and it doesn't look like they're breeding them in the canyon. To our knowledge, there's no eggshell that's ever been recovered in Chaco Canyon. Um, you know, there's there's a variety of indications here. Um, many of the macaws, most of the vast majority of the macaws from Chaco Canyon actually died uh, as um, sub-adults or juveniles uh, before they might have even reached reproductive age. There's one aged macaw, there's one older macaw a skeleton in Chaco Canyon, but uh, that's about it. So there's very limited evidence and there have been great studies done, uh, isotopic analyses, again, that I hope my colleagues will talk about in May to address this question uh, and genetic work as well that demonstrate that the birds are probably being bred at a breeding center, but outside of Chaco Canyon. Hmm. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Speaking of um, many of the birds are subadults when they're yeah cause to be dead um there was a question about you know do you have any idea what was causing the how how were they killed how did they die no. were they buried were they buried alive or were they killed do, do you have any sense of what might have been going on with them it's very hard in terms of zooarchaeological evidence it's exceptionally challenging to see how animals are killed um there are some exceptions uh, that are not pleasant to talk about but um, you know, if, if a bird was hit over the head or, uh, if a bird's, if a bird was, um, you know, if it's windpipe was, was choked or crushed, um, sometimes we can see those things, but, uh, it's, we really don't have a good idea of how birds were being killed in the past. Um, I would be surprised personally, I would be surprised if they were buried alive, they were probably killed in ways that were a bit. Uh, more humane so for example smothering the bird mm -hmm. um but yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no that makes sense yeah. yeah thanks yeah good question though um a couple questions about room 38 um does it look like the birds found in the layer of bird droppings were they deliberately buried as well or did they just die and get left there or do you have a sense of what was going on there those are, that's another great question. Uh, it's one myself and, and colleagues are still working through. So mm -hmm. that's a particular room where we are really limited in the case of Chaco Canyon uh, by the detail that's present in excavation records. So mm -hmm. the folks that excavated Pueblo Bonito in the 1890s and the 1920s, uh, for the time they took really good notes, uh, but they didn't take good notes relative to our standards today. There is a lot of information. There are a lot of drawings. There's a lot of photographs. There's a lot of notes, but it's hard in a lot of these rooms to reconstruct exactly how those birds were. Um, those 12 macaws are, you know, one of the things we can look at is completeness of the skeleton, right? So are these complete macaws? Are they partial macaws? Um, which tells us a little bit about human behavior. They are, I, if I'm remembering correctly, for the most part, those 12 macaws are complete macaws. Um, which is to say that, you know, there's two possible interpretations of that room and I haven't yet decided which I'm committed to, so stay tuned. But, you know, the birds could have died in that room and, and sort of just fallen down and, and that's where they lay, or they could have been placed there on purpose. But basically, you know, the way we excavate today is so careful and so minute and that's, we don't have a sort of great way to reconstruct what it exactly looked like in the past. So we're limited by that. But, you know, ask me in six months to a year and I might have a better answer for you once I've tried to do a little bit more work on that particular room. Excellent. Excellent. And one more about 38, just mm -hmm. FYI, it was someone was interested in terms of whether there was any evidence of um, what they might have been feeding the macaws in that room. 
Yes, Any ideas? yes, yes, it's a great question. We do actually have notes on that in records from the time um, excavation records. So there were other things found in that layer of bird droppings. Mm -hmm. So various types of seeds and nuts, especially squash, squash seeds, excuse me, uh, pinion nuts and things like that. So it looks like they were being provisioned with uh, nuts and seeds and probably fruit, but um, I don't know of any fruit remains that have been found in that room. But again, it's a situation where um, at that time, people were really hand collecting things rather than screening or floating uh, soil. So we don't recover a lot of that stuff. I don't even know if it was kept, but the excavators did note that they saw uh, nuts and seeds that were in that layer of droppings. Cool. Yeah, that's nice. That's good to know. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, someone was wanting to know if um, the location, if there's some changes of location differences, like if you're finding middens, there are more perhaps food birds versus, is there differences in the locations of where you're, the uses of the birds, depending on what the, their location is? Sorry, my yeah. mouth is not working tonight. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. The answer is, uh, it's not, that's, so a lot of the excavations that happened in great houses and small houses really focused on excavating interior rooms. So rooms mm -hmm. within the walls of the Pueblos, mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's where excavators thought they would find the best stuff, right? So there wasn't a ton of, uh, there were trenches that were put through the mounds uh, that are sitting out in front of Pueblo Benito. Uh, but then there are various interpretations of whether or not those mounds were actually specifically only for trash or if they were supposed to be ceremonial in nature. And so, uh, we really find the remains of many different kinds of birds in all of these spaces. In context where we do actually have excavations from middens or mounds, um, we see the same kinds of birds that we see, uh, whose remains we find in within those interior spaces as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. What about uh, differences? You talked about differences between the great houses and the small houses. What are there differences between great houses? There are differences between great houses. Okay. Yes, <laughs> there is. I didn't present on, on it this evening, but um, and stay tuned for a forthcoming book chapter. Actually, um, a, a great study uh, with two of my colleagues, uh, Samantha Flad and Adam Watson, where we looked at um, the distribution of eagles, macaws and turkeys, those three most abundant birds across multiple great houses. And it looks like only one great house really has access to all three of those types of birds, while at several other great houses, they only had access to uh, one or two of those types of birds. Everybody's pretty got tur pretty much got turkey everywhere, but then macaws and eagles don't show up at all great houses. So there are differences within great houses that continue to reinforce this idea that Pueblo Benito may have been the most prominent great house in the canyon. Uh, of course, it's the only great house that was nearly completely excavated. So uh, we have to reckon the fact that, you know, Pueblo Alto, for example, was only, uh, I think, about 10% excavated. And then uh, Pueblo del Arroyo, another great house, was only about 50% excavated. And then some minor excavations at Chetro Kettle, too. So we have the best records from Benito. Um, but based on what we do have, it looks like there may have been differences in the acquisition of these, these important ceremonial birds between great houses. And the fact that we find uh, that... Uh, you know, room 38 interpreted as an aviary. There's another room like that in Pueblo Benito that may have served a similar function. And we don't see any other types of rooms like that at other great houses, which means, you know, you could possibly interpret that Benito is importing these birds and then distributing them within the canyon. So sort of maintaining control over access to those birds. Well, Caitlin, there's been a lot of questions as you sure, as you probably guessed, there's there's a number of questions people wanting to know about um, feathers. Do you have any evidence of feathers, feather yeah. use? Were yeah. they talk, talk, talk to us about feathers and birds? Yeah, and talk chaco. about feathers. Yeah, there are <laughs> feathers that have been recovered from Chaco. As, as everyone probably knows, feathers don't preserve nearly as well as bone does, although the Southwest is great for its arid conditions, very, very beneficial to feather preservation. Uh, but they are very few in number, but they do, they have been found in Chaco Canyon. I'd have to look back at my data, but I know we have turkey feathers. We have the occasional macaw feather. Uh, we have, I believe, uh, some feathers from the red shafted flicker, uh, which is a very beautiful bird if you're familiar with it. So there are uh, unique instances of feather preservation. Um, sometimes they are uh, attached to sticks, 
right? So potentially prayer sticks. Sometimes they are um, attached to corn cobs, actually. So, um, but again, the number of these um, instances are, are very few. So uh, it doesn't, you know, the bone in that way is sort of a, a more robust way to shed light on how people are interacting with these birds. But it's, um, you know, feather uh, use is uh, something we're pretty confident people were engaged in in Chaco Canyon. And it's something, of course, we see uh, uh, abundantly at uh, modern and historic pueblos today. Is there any evidence of any like um, capture and keeping of raptors? Mm -hmm. I wish. Um, there? No, <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping for some of that. So um, no. And one of the ways we we look for that is evidence of pathology, of skeletal pathologies. So uh, indicators on bones that suggest that birds were either injured or suffered infection and that they were cared for long enough for those, uh, those traumas to heal. Um, raptor, uh, I knew someone was gonna ask me this. Um, <laughs> raptor bones uh, don't, there's one or two cases of pathology on raptor remains, and there's a lot of raptor bones in the assemblage. So it's mm. really, really infrequent, uh, which is not to say that people couldn't have been and weren't keeping raptors, but the things that we can visually assess uh, to determine if they were are not really there. And for comparison, there are a lot of pathologies on turkey bones and on the macaw remains as well, uh, but we do not see it commonly on raptors. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a couple questions people are asking that whether anybody, whether they could have been keeping any of these birds just for pets mm -hmm. or just, just because they kept them. Yeah. I guess, and I think that is, you know, keeping them because you enjoy keeping them is not necessarily mutually exclusive, right. but also, you know, using their feathers. You can certainly pluck birds on occasion and then wait for them to regrow their feathers. Uh, we know people were plucking macaws. Um, but you know, these are birds with great personalities, right? So, and, and they're challenging to raise, they bond, you know, th there's a parrot on my acknowledgement slide and that's a parrot that lives with us currently. And um, you know, they bond with one person and they develop these really strong bonds. And our parrot is not a macaw, but macaws are notorious for that. And so, you know, you, especially if there were individual people that were inter interacting with individual birds, um, there's a sort of relationship that's established there, right? And so, uh, caring for these birds and, and enjoying their personalities uh, was probably quite common. So, um, so that is to say, I, you know, I don't know how people felt about turkeys, right? And I don't even know how people felt about macaws, but the fact that people were caring for these animals and keeping them alive and feeding them and engaging with them um, uh, seems to have been really important. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and you answered another question because we actually had a question that someone wanted to know who was that parrot in the last slide. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. She's our, she's our pet parrot. She's, she's a Pionis parrot and she's a rescue, but um, she's a, a little 30 year old bird. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. She's a cutie. There's, um, there's been a couple of questions. Gosh, the questions keep coming fast and furious. There's no <laughs> way we're going to be able to get through all of these guys. So um, we're going to try to answer a bunch of them. And um, if, if Caitlin has time and sure. feels like um, doing any more answers that we could put of up course. online, we'll do that. But yeah, you know, my pleasure on, on her either. But um, there were a couple of questions I thought was, would be interesting is, um, are there other fauna that non-avian um, that is, that perhaps is showing up in, um, you know, in conjunction with the birds? Is there mm. some kind of connection that you see between the birds and mammal, any kind of special mammals or? That's a great question, actually. Um, in terms of the bird burials, there, the bird burials occur, you know, as singular individuals or multiple individuals, but with other birds. Um, I don't, to my memory at this moment, I don't think there are any cases of, you know, um, bird burials with mammal burials, for example, although I, I could be misremembering, maybe there's one or two, but if so, it's not very common. Um, uh, the remains of other mammals do show up in, in ceremonial contexts or ritual contexts. So we have caches of, you know, uh, the bones from bear paws, for example, um, or dog claws, things like that. Carnivores seem to have been really important, um, as well as uh, uh, certain types of, 
uh, artiodactyls, so your bighorn sheep, your mule deer, your pronghorn antelope, stuff like that. Um, so we do see parts of mammals that are used, that were probably used in making ritual objects, or we see them isolated in these nice little caches, right? So these little holes created in walls, for example, and then tucked in there. Um, as far as any consistent associations between, you know, certain types of birds and certain types of mammals, uh, that's not something that I've seen. Um, let's see, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, someone is asking, here's an easy one while I look through the list. Um, were there any owls? Yes, yes, there were owls. There's ah. great horned owl. Um, let me look for you. I have it right here. There's, cause I can't remember the other one. So there's great horned, there's Western screech owl and there's barn owl. Okay. And then something that looks like long eared owl. So four kinds of owl. Yeah, they're not super abundant uh, in the assemblage. The most abundant is great horned owl, mm -hmm. um, but there are uh, uh, several bones of these other types of owls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, has there been any analysis of birds and petroglyphs in the canyon? Mm -hmm. you know, Holly uh, talked yes. about petroglyphs last week. And yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, stay tuned for okay. the special issue on birds of Archaeology Magazine, because Jane Colber is writing uh, an article on birds in Chaco rock art. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, there have been a sub sub several questions. People are curious about where they can read more about your work. Hmm. Um, yeah. The upcoming magazine obviously mm -hmm. is one, but yes. are there other, other um, things coming out? Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> there are, um, so there's a special archaeology magazine issue. There are a couple uh, book chapters that are coming out in the near future that are in press at the moment. Um, let's see what else. The, the main source of all of this information is my dissertation. So mm -hmm. that is available as well. Uh, and then in the coming years, I hope to uh, start producing more publications on this work. So um, you should see it popping out in various venues uh, in the next, let's say, one to five years. <laughs> You have a few other things to do too, right? You know, just keeping the head above water in, in the pandemic is is a is a special kind of task. Yeah, yeah. And you may have—I can't remember if you addressed this or not—but did you do all the um, identification of these animal, the bones? You had to go this back is, and do them all yourself again, or do? It's them? a great question. I benefited immensely from a lot of work that had been done by Steve Emsley, Nancy Akins, a little bit by Lyndon Hargrave. So a proportion of the material that I analyzed had been taxonomically identified. Okay. So in those cases, I went back and I just reassessed those identifications. In certain cases, I updated them or changed mm -hmm. them. Um, but that was tremendous work that had been done by people before me. And then the rest of the assemblage, um, I made new taxonomic identifications on because there was material that hadn't been analyzed yet. Mm -hmm. So um, so a combination of both of those things. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yeah. There's been some comments about, again, the, the macaws at Pueblo Benito and mm -hmm. stuff that it, that it appears that those rooms might be in the oldest section. Yes. And is there, yes, is, you know, where they're drawing some analogy with you're saying that mm -hmm. the bird pit at Pueblo Alto is also the oldest section. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. see some meaning there? Yes. Yes, of course. So most, so all of the macaw burials, so the depositions of these complete or partially articulated macaws, all of those occur in that red section of Pueblo Benito. So the Northern mm -hmm. Arc, the first part of the Pueblo that was built. That also happens to be the section of the Pueblo in which those two very famous uh, rooms that contain multiple burials, um, human burials were found. And so the way that that's been interpreted is that, or at least by, by uh, some scholars, is that uh, those might have been the founders of Pueblo Benito. And then that portion of Pueblo Benito also happens to be really materially rich in terms of uh, ceremonial resources. So things that were highly valued, like turquoise, like birds, uh, other shell and things like that. Um, and so we do see macaws, especially playing into uh, sort of the founding of that section of the Pueblo. There mm -hmm. are macaw remains that are found outside of that arc, but they are not. Uh, there are a couple of cases where they are do appear to be, so I should say outside of Pueblo Benito, so in the 
um, uh, the mounds just in front of Pueblo Benito. There are a couple, there's one, I believe, complete and one partially articulated uh, parrot or macaw. And then uh, there's some other um, uh, examples of macaws that we aren't exactly sure if they're burials or not, just based on the information that we have. So there does seem to be an association between the establishment of some of these great houses and using uh, various valuable types of birds. Hmm. Got someone wondering about that room 38 again. <laughs> and I think that too. It's that, okay, it's this, it's like this room here in the back in the middle. Right. Restricted access. I mean, how would you even, would it have been dark? How would you even <laughs> gotten in there? Yeah. Uh, is there any evidence of like natural light letting in or anything? Or we're just well, these to are conceptualize. <laughs> yeah, it just depends. So these are multi-story pueblos, right? And, yeah. and Pueblo Benito was as high as four and maybe even five stories tall in certain places. So if these are, it's often hard to tease these things out because of room collapse. But, uh, you know, depending on the floor that these rooms are on, there's going to be very limited slash no light. And they're very challenging to get to in terms of, you know, navigating through all of these rooms. You can look at those maps. Uh, so I, I adapt all of my maps from the Chaco Research Archive online, which is a phenomenal resource for all of these records on Chaco Canyon. And you can look at those maps uh, of Pueblo Benito and you can kind of kind of go and trace your access to these different rooms and try to figure out how people would have gotten there and how challenging it would have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep throwing questions at you fast and furious. That's we'll, okay. We'll wrap up pretty soon, but I, have a, <laughs> this, I think this is an interesting thing to um, think about. I'm just gonna read it. Um, yeah. How we categorize birds affects all subsequent analytical results. Um, your analysis focuses on categories that reflect typical Western scientific categories, raptors, turkeys, perching birds. Mm -hmm. She says, I keep wondering what differences in spatial patterns might be revealed by categorizing birds according to modern Puebloan yes. traditional knowledge of birds instead. Yes. And do you plan to explore bird mm -hmm. distribution in terms of different conceptual categories in the future, yes. for example, feather color? Or... Yeah, yeah. Whoever asked this question, I want to meet you and talk to you. It's a brilliant <laughs> question and it is something I'm working on. So, and it's something I need to consider in greater detail. I talk a little bit about it in other places, but um, it, yes, 100%, you know, uh, ornithologies, how we classify birds. So the scientific taxonomy, the Linnaean framework that we use within zooarchaeology, zooarchaeology is, of course, because the way we're identifying these bones is in reference to modern skeletons that are also categorized using right. those uh, species, right? And so certainly it is the case that people uh, in the Pueblo today, in the region in the past, did not categorize those birds in strictly the way that scientific taxonomy does. And so it's important to consider how uh, in certain cases, you know, um, we can see either a greater level of specificity or less specificity in terms of how birds are lumped together. So, for example, people might recognize multiple different kinds of birds based on, you know, that we would consider the same species based on changes in their plumage related to season, related to age, um, we can also see people sort of, you know, grouping multiple types of birds into that we would consider separate species in the scientific framework it, as, you know, the same species or the same type of bird. So those categories certainly did not map. The ones we use today certainly did not map on, on the past. Um, so it is uh, definitely worth exploring. And there are a couple of, there's at least one, um, sort of ornithological account of how people classify birds at several different pueblos and uh, the terms that people use for different types of birds, how they reference them, how they name them can be really telling in how people conceive of their relationship to one another. So for example, it's quite possible that people consider the red-tailed hawk to be a kind of eagle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, just depends on, on where you're looking. So uh, yeah, that is just such a magnificent point and is something that I've started to think about, but that needs uh, more work in terms of playing with where we find uh, those different patterns in the record. So there's always some new questions, something new to think about and explore. Yes. You learn a little bit and then we start, we start coming up with new questions. Exactly. I guess that's the whole point, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Well, like I said, there's still questions, but I think we need to sort of wrap this thing up for the <laughs> evening. Um, and like sure. I said, we'll share the things. And if you do feel like answering any of more of them, sure. But if you don't, um, we'll just have to have you come back and do another talk again. Sounds great. Just a Q&A. <laughs> and everybody should read the magazine when they, it comes out. And hopefully yes, it's going to be great. Questions too, so yeah, Nicole, it's do you want to come back and join us for a couple, a wrap up here? Here I be. So well done. Um, Linda's computer worked all day long. And then at 20 minutes before <laughs> airtime, it decided it needed to uh, kill itself. So um, yes, it was the infamous blue screen of death. <laughs> thanks to both of you for uh, staying calm throughout, and and uh, we had wonderful attendance tonight. So thanks all of our attendees um, for your time, and and uh, went really well uh, ultimately here. So um, I learned a lot. I think all of our attendees did, and we've got uh, literally. Uh, 28 days from now, March 1st, uh, Kelly Hayes Gilpin will join us and she'll be discussing birds, feathers, and ancient Pueblo pottery. So we'll come back to some feathers um, that uh, got uh, a beginning tonight, but uh, have a great month um, and we will see you soon. And thank you very much, Caitlin. Yeah, very thank enjoyable. you. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Mm -hmm. Good night. Night all. <laughs>